My name is Christian Ashley, a seminary student and servant of God, and you are listening to the Let Nothing Move You podcast, a proud Anazal Ministries podcast. Welcome back, everyone, to the next episode of the Let Nothing Move You podcast. I'm your host, Christian Ashley, as we continue on through the book of Exodus. A little bit of housekeeping real quick. Uh, my microphone stand that I've been using for the past couple of episodes decided that it lost the will to live and kind of just ejected the mic from it. So if I was still going to use that mic, I'd have to hold it in my hand. So I'd rather not do that. So I'm using an older mic, one that has proven effective before. So there's that. So if there's any audio quality issues, it's because it's not used to it again. So I'm having to re you know, conjigger whatever some things. So there we go. As well, just to continue hyping up future episodes. Next time you hear me, will be Exodus 19. I won't be alone. I'll be with Joshua Knoll. He of the Whole Church Podcast, Dummy for Theology, Systematic Ecology, and about 50 other different things that we both do. <laughs> uh, we'll talk about Exodus 19. Then for Exodus 20, Pastor Will Rose of Holy Trinity Lutheran Church of Chapel Hill will be here with me. He of the Homily, Systematic Ecology, and occasional appearances on Whole Church as well. Ready to talk the Ten Commandments with him. Then Karairo, the Foreign Saints podcast, will be with me to do Exodus 21 through 22 as we go over some of the social justice laws of Scripture. Really looking forward to that one. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and get into this bad boy. We'll be in Exodus 17 and 18 today, starting with verses 1 through 7 of 17. All the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages, according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped at Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore, the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go, Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massa, which means testing, and Meribah, which means quarreling, because of the quarreling of the people of of Israel, and because they tested the Lord by saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Once more, God directs his people to an inhospitable region of the Sinai Peninsula. And once more, they fail the test to trust in him and pray to him for deliverance. Now, I don't know about you, I'm already getting tired of repeating the same thing of how they shouldn't be doing this because it's been about five to six chapters since they left Egypt behind. And how many times has this happened since? How many times have they not learned their lesson? But that's the thing about ministering to people, about leading people, is that you can tell them the exact thing they need to do, and then it's up to them to actually do it. I know I've had mentors in the past who get angry at me for not listening to the good things they were saying because I was being stubborn or foolish or what have you. The same thing applies to the people under our command, under our leadership, is we're going to say, hey, look. Looking at this uh, situation objectively, here's what you need to do, and sometimes they're not going to listen. Sometimes they're going to choose to do their own thing and then complain when that thing goes wrong, even though you told them that would happen. And for the people of Israel, this exact same thing is occurring. They know what they're supposed to do, but instead of doing what they're supposed to do, they engage in irrational whining and complaining when they know exactly what they need to do to change their current situation, which is once again, prayer, humbleness, and supplication before God. He got them out of the last ones. So did they really think that this was the time that he was really going to just, well, time for them to die. I tricked those idiots into thinking they could get out of Egypt, even though I delivered them time and time again. Nope, this is the moment where I just end them all, where I let them die of starvation, or it's going to be a die of dehydration. It's going to be real funny. Watch this, guys. Yeah, it's absurd. It's understandable on the Israeli side of things in that, hey, you need water to survive. We've talked about this last time. 
We've talked about it before, as we did with Nick uh, when we talked about the Nile turning to blood. But still, that's not where they need to be. They should know better. We should know better when we are spiritually dehydrated because we went into the desert of our own sin. When we've removed ourselves from the good places of God, or when we are taken to places by God where we feel spiritually dehydrated, he wanted us to be there, and we lash out against him rather than saying, what do you want me to learn from this? What do you want me to do in this situation? How can I learn? How can I be humble? How can I get your will done in this world? Even when I myself feel like I'm unable to do it because I'm exhausted, because I'm tired. Because the people against me just make it harder to do my job. Our reaction to situations is, well, isn't supposed to be, well, God just abandoned us. And I'm not going to listen to what he has to say. It's, no, what am I supposed to be learning from this? How am I supposed to be taught by this scenario? And what do you want me to do? Tell me and I'll do it. Moses, in this scenario, in this anguish he feels at his people's ephemeral faith, Praise to God for relief and understanding, which God then offers. I, Moses offers an honest prayer. God offers an honest answer. And this allows them once more to survive as Moses is gifted by God supernaturally with the ability to deliver water to the people. You can't do this. You don't hit a rock in the middle of the desert with a staff and then suddenly water jits out of it. That is a miracle. That is divine providence in place bringing this about. God once more provided a physical need of the people, despite their spiritual need for him being a higher priority, because he loved his people, even in their apostasy. But his patience can only last so long. And we're going to see multiple times over what brings him to that breaking point is their lack of faith in him. Eventually, in numbers, when the spies are sent out, and he curses them to wander for 40 years. Now, if I remember correctly, there's an unnamed psalmist of Psalm 95. We're going to be in verses 6 through 11 real quick, where in the NIV, we see, Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, the flock under His care. Today, if only you would hear His voice— do not harden your hearts as you did at Maribah, as you did that day at Massa in the wilderness, where your ancestors tested me. They tried me. Though they had seen what I did for 40 years, I was angry with that generation. I said, they are a people whose hearts go astray and they have not known my ways. So I declared an oath on my, in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. This is how seriously God takes those moments of apostasy, those moments of us not doing as we're told simply because we're allowing the things of this world or our own thoughts or emotions or what have you to distract us from him. He is enough, but we forget that and we allow other things to take precedence and that causes us to drift away. That causes us to think, well, maybe he's not real. Maybe he doesn't love me. Maybe he only loves other people. Maybe I'm not good enough. We're not good enough, but he makes us good enough. And he's going to mold the people of Israel to be people who worship him, knowing that generations after this, they're going to fall into apostasy once more and lead people astray and then come back to him and then walk away and then come back to him and walk away. And yet he does not give up on them because he is a God of mercy and of wrath. So he will punish when the punishment needs to come. He will extend mercy when the mercy needs to be extended. That is exactly what he does for the people of Israel multiple times over. And we'll go from there to verses 8 through 16. Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. Then, so Moses said to Joshua, Choose for us men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek, while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed, and whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands grew weary, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it, while Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. So his hands were steady until the going down of the sun, and Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the sword. 
Then the Lord said to Moses, write this as a memorial in a book and recite it in the ears of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it, the Lord is my banner, saying a hand upon the throne of the Lord. The Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Now, before we get to the people of Amalek, we see the introduction of Joshua in the narrative of the Exodus. We know nothing of him before now, but clearly he is someone that Moses trusts to get the job done. You may recall in Exodus 13, if I recall correctly, where God directly moved the people out of the way of Philistia so that they didn't have to fight them because they're not ready for it. Yet he does bring them towards Amalek because they're smaller and they're still going to pose a threat but one that's going to force Israel to band together to stop them. Israel is not a mighty nation right now. They're not a warrior nation right now. This is their first test in battle through physical means where they're going to have to fight. Now, for Joshua, like I said, we don't know too much about him. Perhaps, you know, he had showed his faith multiple times over in Egypt in the wilderness, and that's how Moses got to know him better, got to trust him as one of his people he would get counsel from or something like that, or that he would pour into. But we simply don't know. It's just not there in the text, much like her as well. uh, There's some speculation that her, who is brought up here for the first time, is maybe Miriam's husband or something like that. But we simply don't know. It's not explained to us. But they're close enough to Moses that he trusts him to do these individual tasks. Because we know Aaron, Moses' brother, so we know Moses trusts him. So by association, we can definitively say Moses trusts these people to get the job done. But regardless of how Joshua ended up here, he shows that Moses' faith in him is well-placed as he leads Israel to victory in this chapter. Once again, Israel is not a fighting force. You have to command 12, 13-ish different tribes to come together and get this done. That is a massive undertaking. There are different cultures and rituals and people and personalities involved here that if you try to get them all together, how are you supposed to do that? Well, Joshua does the job, and he does it well against a group of people who are known for their ferocity. And these Amalekites are some of the worst of the worst when it came to the ancient world. They're a bunch of parasites. Uh, I hate to say it, but that's exactly what their civilization is based around being. They are a band of rapacious raiders who are among the vilest tribes that we encounter in Scripture. Never are they shown in a good light, and it is well-deserved as their culture was based on attacking traitors, wanderers, and the weak so that they could enrich themselves. We see how they choose to attack Israel. How do they do so? From behind. They attack Israel's flank, which probably was composed of the elderly, women and children, and they went after those weakest so that they could potentially either just murder them, steal their valuables, maybe enslave them again. And I should say we see that in other things like Deuteronomy. I didn't have those texts in front of me, but we see it as God is throwing curses against the Amalekites, this is one of the reasons why. So I apologize. It's not actually in the Exodus text. If I Yes. But these people, if you need some more, your more fictional examples, like think of them as someone like akin to the Iron Islanders of House Greyjoy, who just, they don't, we don't reap. Uh, we do not sow. Uh, they just take from other people. Then we have like the Raiders of Fallout, the kind of like different Raider gangs we see in a series. Their job, they're not growing crops or anything like that. No, they're stealing from people who do while they're at their most vulnerable so that they can live off of that as leeches, as parasites. That is the cultural context of who the Amalekite people were. They would be seen as terrorists today. There would be special operations by the U.S. government to wipe them out of existence. In the same way, we're, we're doing the things like you know ISIS and the Houthis and so on and so forth, because they don't work well with people and they refuse to change. This is who they are. They have given in to their sin to the point where the entire culture is consumed by the idea of we take because we deserve, and they don't care who gets caught in the crossfire. They are simply put, evil people who get exactly what they deserve in this chapter. 
And this is despite their common ancestry with Israel through Jacob's brother Esau. So we know that they grew up hearing of God. Esau was no perfect man. And in fact, there's an argument he made he was never God's. But he still grew up in an environment where God was preached, where God was spoken of, where God intervened in their lives. So the stories had to have been passed down. So even though Amalek, if I remember correctly, is a grandson of Esau, those stories existed. You know how I know that the teaching of God was handed down to other generations? Because we have people like the Ishmaelites, where Jethro comes from, and we'll see him in the next chapter, who still proclaim the word of God. So clearly some of them were doing what they were supposed to, being descendants of Abraham. But along the way, people refused to listen. And the Amalekites are a perfect example of that. They had soundly rejected God and for this and their actions and their evil and their denial of God, they were added to the list of tribes and nations that the Israelites were to wipe out. Guess what? They weren't on the original list. That was the Canaanites. The Amalekites are not Canaanites. They are descended from Abraham. So which makes their apostasy and their evil even worse. Now, this, of course, this idea of genociding an entire group of people makes us very uncomfortable with our modern sensibilities. And it should make us uncomfortable because this is not something done lightly. And because the loss of life as an image bearer of God is not something we just ignore and go, well, they were just evil. So it's okay if God says to murder them, but it's not murder. It's self-defense. God never tells anyone to murder. God does not tell people to do evil. That is the antithesis antithesis of who he is. And this is something that he himself has demanded to be done. There was nothing good about the Amalekites, and there was no repentance in their hearts. To allow them to live was to allow death, devastation, assault, and ruin to anyone who encountered them. It was far more merciful for them to to the directive to be established here that they deserved to be wiped out than it was for them to be allowed to remain living in evil and inflicting that evil on others. If you look forward in the biblical narrative, we will see them wiped out, but only after hundreds of years. In the reign of King Hezekiah, in First Chronicles, we see that they are fully wiped out. There's some speculation that maybe Haman the Agagite might be an Amalekite, and then actually in Esther, that's where it ends, but I will save that for another day. So what this means is that after hundreds of years, God allowed them to remain alive and gave them ample time to repent, and this was rejected by their sinful hearts. How long is too long to wait? Wouldn't it have been better for all the people who are going to suffer on the Amalekites for them to just be wiped out now? But God, being merciful, gave them time to repent, knowing they would never do so. That's mercy and love. This is not a God who just arbitrarily decides, I hate these people, I'm going to murder them all. No, that's not who God is. I love these people, but I hate what they're doing, and I hate what they're going to do to everyone else. So wipe them out, kill them to prevent others from suffering from what they could do. It brings me no pleasure to say that they got what they deserve because I know where they end up. But it does give me pleasure that God gave them more opportunities to repent than they deserved because he is a loving, just God who will also bring his wrath on those who deny him and harm his creations. And that's going to happen when we get to the Canaanites as well. This is no decision of God just saying, "Uh, well, racially, I just hate these people. No, this is a heart issue that God hates. It's a cultural issue that stems from the prideful heart that says, I deserve, I take, I take, I take, because I'm me, because I myself am God. And there's only ever one God, and he cannot abide in that presence. Yet he still offers opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to change and repent, knowing these people would never do that, knowing their final destination would be an eternity without living with him. Yet he gave them time anyways. And from there... We'll go to chapter 18, verses 1 through 12. 
Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people, how the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. Now Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, had taken Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her home, along with her two sons. The name of the one was Gershom, for he said, I had been a sojourner in a foreign land. And the name of the other, Eliezer, for he said, the God of my father was my help and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife to Moses in the wilderness where he was encamped at the mountain of God. And when he sent word to Moses, I, your father-in-law Jethro, am coming to you with your wife and her two sons with her. Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and bowed down and kissed him. And they asked each other of their welfare and went into the tent. Then Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake, all the hardship that had come upon them in the way, and how the Lord had delivered them. And Jethro rejoiced for all the good that the Lord had done to Israel, and that he had delivered them out of the hand of the Egyptians. Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord who has delivered you out of the hand of Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh, and has delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods, because in this affair they dealt arrogantly with the people. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and sacrifices to God, and Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law for God. Here we have one of the more unsung heroes of the Bible. And in here we have Jethro, who shows why a true leader should strive to first honor and love God before concerning himself with other matters. We see that he took in his daughter and grandchildren to protect them should something go wrong for Moses in Egypt. And he shows no disregard for his son-in-law for the dangerous life he chose to enter in his personal service to God. He doesn't say, Moses, you shouldn't be doing this. It's dangerous. You shouldn't go to Pharaoh. How could God bring your people out of Egypt? It's impossible. No, he accepted what had to be done and loved his son-in-law. It says a lot about him that Moses, as the chosen leader of God's people, and the one who directed them out of Egypt, that he is the one who bowed down first in humbleness before Jethro, and that he listens to his father-in-law's counsel. How many times have you heard people complaining about their in-laws, whether it be the mother-in-law or the father-in-law or what have you? There's always something that makes people upset. That's not how the relationship is supposed to be. It's not what God desires from that. People allow their petty concerns to get in the way of things or being unbudging in how they view the world. But Jethro is the opposite of that. He's not perfect. We're not shown any of his specific sins, if I recall correctly, because we see him as a man. And as a man, he's fallen short of God. He's born under original sin. So he's definitely done wrong in his life. But he still offers wisdom and comfort to his son-in-law who is doing the work of God alongside him. And that's what we are called to do. So think of those times when you're dealing with your in-laws, when you're dealing with the pressures of life alongside everything, and they're not being reasonable, or maybe you're the one who's not being reasonable. And then recognize what needs to change. Because for Moses and Jethro, they rejoice in each other's company. They rejoice at the news of how faithful God has been to the Israelites. Jethro praises God for his might, and then he sacrifices to him as a further sign of his piety and fealty. That is the kind of man of God I want to be, who recognizes what other people are doing in God's service. That has nothing to do with me, and yet I can look at what he's doing to them, doing through them, and praise that, and encourage them, and look after them, and celebrate with them. That is what we're called to do, and Jethro is a perfect example of how to do that right. And he's going to continue on in this chapter being a wise man who has clearly learned over the years how to handle himself as a leader so that he can act as a mentor to his son-in-law, who will one day do the same for Joshua, so that that can continue as often as possible, so that the people can be led effectively. That is what a good man of God does as the leader. That is our position. No matter how small that leadership role is, we are called to be that to the world, to those around us. Once again, no matter how small, this is what we're called to do, to uplift others, to praise them, and to help them out when they need it. And we're going to see how Jethro helps out by finishing off this chapter with verses 13 through 27. 
The next day, Moses set to judge the people, and the people stood around Moses from morning till evening. When Moses' father-in-law saw, that all, excuse me, saw all that he was doing for the people, he said, What is this that you are doing for the people? Why do you sit alone and all the people stand around you from morning till evening? And Moses said to his father-in-law, Because the people come to me to inquire of God, when they have a dispute, they come to me, and I decide between one person and another, and I make them know the statutes of God and his laws. Moses' father-in-law said to him, What you are doing is not good. You and the people with you will certainly wear yourselves out, for the thing is too heavy for you. You are not able to do it alone. Now you, excuse me, now obey my voice. I will give you advice, and God be with you. You shall represent the people before God and bring their cases to God, and you shall warn them about the statutes and the laws and make them know the way in which they must walk and what they must do. Moreover, look for able men from all the people, men who fear God, who are trustworthy and hate a bribe, and place such men over the people as chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens. And let them judge the people at all times. Every great matter they shall bring to you, but any small matter they shall decide themselves. So it will be easier for you, and they will bear the burden with you. If you do this, God will direct you. You will be able to endure, and all this people also will go in their, uh, will go to their place in peace. So Moses listened to the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he had to say. Moses chose able men out of all Israel and made them heads over the people, chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens. And they judged the people at all times, and any hard case they brought to Moses, but any small matter they decided themselves. Then Moses let his father-in-law depart, and he went away to his own country. Now at the start, Moses is doing a very good thing for the people in handling their disputes. That's what a good leader should do to guide the people, to help mediate between them. And despite their grumbling and complaints over the past couple chapters, the past couple weeks and months, he is the person that they trust the most to handle their individual cases in an honest and impartial manner. And that speaks a lot to his character, that they believe this of him, that they're willing to take it to him. That's good. I want to be known as someone you can trust in that regard. But, however... Moses has made the fatal mistake of being the only one capable of doing this. A good leader knows they can't do everything alone and that they need to delegate matters to other trusted people so that they can focus on the more important matters. This doesn't mean that the concerns of the people aren't important. But if a pastor or leader is spending too much of his time on this, it prevents him from being able to preach, teach, and minister effectively. We see this later on in the book of Acts. The apostles are trying to lead the people of God. They are evangelizing to them. They're preaching about the word of God. But there's also concerns about how we got to take care of the widows and the orphans and everything. And that's part of their job is like organizing things to take care of them. But it isn't their job to do it alone. So they set up people who can do the task that they trust, who will actually look after these people and do their job effectively so that they don't have to worry about it, so that they can focus on other more important matters. Once again, that doesn't mean the suffering and the plight of the widow and orphan is not important, but you've got to be able to delegate. You've got to be able to say, I need to take care of this. I need someone else who I can trust to take care of that. And that's what Moses is being taught by Jethro here. Be smart in how you lead. You're going to ruin yourself if you keep this up. And Jethro, seeing Moses' work, kindly rebukes him for taking the entire burden on himself, which will make him burn out swiftly if he remains like this. He cautions Moses to choose men capable of resisting evil and temptation and who would ably watch over the people in their charge. That is a good idea. Even though no such perfect men exist in the world, even with all of our faults, these are men called to lead in scenarios such as these. There's no perfect man out there whose name isn't Jesus Christ. So yes, you get the best people you can for the job knowing they're imperfect people, knowing they might make the wrong call. That's why there's a chain of command here. That's why Jethro has him set up 
and the thousands, in the hundreds, and the fifties, and of tens. So if there's an issue with one of the tens, it can go up to the fifties. There's an issue up there, go to the hundreds. If an issue's with there, go to the thousands. If there's an issue there, go directly to Moses. That is an important matter. If four different groups have been unable to complete this, then it becomes Moses' problem. That is a great way to delegate an issue like this. Jethro is so wise and intelligent in how to lead people. And Moses learns from that. A good leader knows the people under his command and has them set up in locations where they can do the most amount of good. That's why in our church setups, we have things like deacons. We have things like elders. We have people who are parts of, you know, uh, mental health response teams in certain churches. We have people in charge of the children's ministry. You have people in charge of the youth ministry. Because the pastor, he can't do that by himself. That is a logical absurdity. You're going to get burnt out within days of attempting to micromanage every part of that. And as someone who despises micromanagement and also wants to be in leadership, this makes perfect sense to me. Let, get, let me have people that I trust to do their job so that I don't have to look behind their backs. They can get the job done without me looking over them. Oh, what you doing over there? Uh, maybe I should intervene. No, let me take care of the things I need to get done. You take care of the things you need to get done. If I need to be involved, let me know so we can get this done together. So that I'm not burnt out while I'm focusing uh, and one day, you know, God willing, if he wants me as a main pastoral role or just an assistant role or what have you, I'm going to have to be focusing on other matters. I'm not going to be able to type out a sermon if I'm visiting everyone or if I'm dealing with internal disputes or if I'm dealing with the budget or what have you. Like someone else needs to take care of these things so that they can do their job effectively. They can report back and say, okay, here's what we did. I can say yay or nay. Then I can move to the things that matter more for that leadership position so that they can get done effectively. And if there are complaints about how that's being done, it can be brought up before me. It can be brought up before your leaders. That's what it's supposed to do. This is how this system is supposed to work. And that's why we are so grateful to Jethro for being so wise. Because no man can take on this burden alone. We need help. We need other people to take on these tasks so that the more important ones are taken care of. And that's what Moses takes from this. Instead of allowing his pride to take over and say, I, what I'm doing is right, Moses listens to someone who knows more than him and then enacts the idea. And this, could you imagine if over the next 40 years, Moses had remained the same way he was? I guarantee you there'd be a lot more dead Israelites if that had happened. But God, in his mercy and his love, brought Jethro back to Moses' life to comfort him and give him something that helped make his incredibly difficult job that much easier. And to everyone out there, and I say this to myself because I am not yet in that leadership position of being over an entire church. Our job is to figure out where we fit in in a church so that we are getting stuff done so that the higher-ups don't have to worry about it. Right now, I just volunteered to go on a children's camp uh, with kids I haven't interacted with because that's not my that's not where I'm at. I love kids. I don't like teaching kids. But there was a, a missing portion of the church where no one was able to take care of that. So I stepped in to make things easier for someone else so that they didn't have to worry. I've done that before. <laughs> I've gone to several camps in the past where it's like, hey, we someone dropped out. I need someone to watch over these kids. Can you do it? And I said, yes, because I know how difficult it is in a leadership position to have a hole in the plan, to have someone not there to fit that role. So what is that in your life? What is it that you can do? Is it to be a greeter? Is it to be a deacon? Is it someone who needs to run the sound and the audio for the church? Is it someone who just you know, reaches out to other members of the church to see how they're doing? We all have important roles we need to do that makes it so that the pastor and the other leaders don't have to worry about them because they have other matters to be concerned about. Because, hey, budgets are important. 
Writing down your sermon is important. Figuring out how to navigate this sin-ridden world in a way that brings honor to God is important. So let's relieve the burden. Let us do what it takes to make sure things run as smoothly as possible. And if they don't, find someone who can and work alongside them wherever God tells you to do that. Every single role in the church is of such great importance, it's not even funny. You know how people know when things are wrong? When someone isn't there to fulfill one of those roles. Then they start seeing the cracks in the system. But it's our job to repair those cracks. So go out there, I encourage you, find out where do you belong in the church. Figure that out. Then go and be faithful in that service. Thank you all for listening today. I uh, had a really good time with this one. Please, if you get a chance, leave a five-star review on your podcasting platform of choice to help us with the ratings there. If you're interested in my own fiction writing, you can find my works at starvingwritersguild.com or on Amazon by searching for the name MC Ashley. If you're all interested in some further solid studies into the Bible and its teachings, then check out the other members of the NSL Ministries Podcasting Network. You can contact me at letnothingmoviepodcast at gmail.com. I'd like to ex- extend a special thank you to Joshua Noel for the editing that he does and for the music he adds to the podcast. And with all that in mind, God bless you all in accordance to his will and not mine. And allow me one more time to remind you, let nothing move you. Hey guys, are you interested in podcasting but don't know where to go? Well, check out Zencaster.com and go ahead and make an account there and use special promo code Let Nothing Move You, all caps. That way you can get 30% off of your next deal to go ahead and set things up so you can figure out how to edit stuff using Zencaster.com to host your stuff to get things done there. So check out Zencaster.com, use special promo code Let Nothing Move You. All right, see ya.